Good evening, fellow pilgrims, and welcome to class. Have a listen to this music, see if you have any idea what it is, and even more, if you might have an idea of why we're listening to it. This one's a little tricky, but you never know. Y'all always surprise me with someone having an idea of what it is. Yes, it is in Latin, if you figured that out. Well, I could keep listening to that forever because it is a glorious piece of music. It is called Vox Dicentis. It is from... Isaiah 40, that wonderful chapter out of Isaiah's prophecies about the Messiah and uh, many passages out of that particular chapter have been put to music. Probably the most famous one is at the end of the chapter of the one who waits on the Lord walking uh, and not growing weary, running and not fainting. But the part we are listening to is earlier in the chapter, and it's where Isaiah talks about the fact that all flesh is like grass, and the glory of man withers like the grass, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And the letter that we're going to be talking about tonight uh, helps us to think about some of these things and realize the great hope that we have in the kingdom of heaven, the great hope that we have in the eternal truth and power of the Lord, by contrast to which the hopes and the power of leaders in this world is as nothing. So before we jump in to this great letter, let's begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of this book, The Screwtape Letters. We thank you for the wisdom that it contains about how to annoy the devil and how to lead a life that is focused on the things of your kingdom. Lord, we confess to you how distracted we are from the things of your kingdom by the things of this world. And we pray that you would help us to learn more and more what it means to love you and to follow you with our whole heart. We pray your blessing on our time together this evening and pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we begin, let's turn to our theme verse from Ephesians that reminds us about the battle in which we find ourselves. This verse is one that is so very important in understanding the spiritual warfare uh, in which we are all engaged, in which we see playing out in our world. So uh, please say this with me uh, wherever you are. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand." Stand firm, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. 
and all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints this is a great reminder to us that not only are we in a battle but we have a role to play in that battle our role is not to go and hide from the battle but our role is to stand firm armed with all of the armor of god and as we go into uh our class this evening i just want to remind us again about why we're studying this book we're looking for a deeper understanding of the battle in which we find ourselves we are looking for the reason that when we see evil in the world we know that there is something behind it it's not just an accident the more that we understand the battle and understand that we have an enemy the better equipped we can be to battle that enemy and the strength of the lord secondly we want to learn to think christianly to think with a christian worldview and to develop that framework for understanding the reality in which we live thirdly we want to look at lessons on the psychology of temptation if we understand the strategy of the enemy to tempt us we are far better able to be prepared against his attacks fourthly we want to learn to cultivate habits that deepen our faith in christ this subtext of habits runs all through the screw tape letters and there last week was that great line uh, where screw tape was berating wormwood for letting the patient acquire the horrible habit of obedience the terrible habit of obedience and so we see that these habits when they become part of our lives really do annoy the devil and help us to live out our faith more boldly which leads us to the last reason that this is such a great book uh, which is that it has a lot of advice about how to live a boldly christian life not just a life that doesn't make any difference a life that is hidden under a rock but a life that makes a difference for the kingdom of heaven and we will see some more about that in tonight's letter so as usual uh, we're going to begin with rehearsing some of the habits from the last few letters and as we said before part of the reason for this is that we know uh from psychology and probably from what our parents told us when we were young that habits are developed largely through repetition we don't particularly like repetition sometimes but it is one of the very best ways to learn so uh, that's part of the reason why we frame each class in the beginning by a reminder of the habits from some of the letters before so back in the letter 24 uh, reminders of the habits from that letter and again uh, just a, a, an aside here it is remarkable how very relevant these letters are to the situation in which we find ourselves in our culture today and we would do well uh, to take seriously the wisdom that Lewis draws from the scriptures in these letters because they really can help inform us in these strange times in which we live on ways to live out our faith so the first habit to annoy the devil from letter 24 be wary of making assumptions about those who do not share your beliefs as our culture becomes more and more polarized it is really easy to demonize people who are not like us who don't think like us who don't look like us who don't believe like us and we as christians must be uh, on our guard against doing that we need to remember that every person is an image bearer of god 
We are all sinners, but we are all made in God's image and worthy of that respect and dignity. And so rather than making assumptions as Christians, we are to be those who reach out and build the bridge of relationship. Secondly, beware of spiritual pride as one of the devil's strongest vices. This is one of the great things in letter 24 where Screwtape gets just really excited talking about spiritual pride. And you can see he is gleeful uh, about the idea that spiritual pride can be developed in the patient. So we certainly don't want to be causing the devil glee. And one of the best ways to avoid that is to seek spiritual humility to be on the lookout against spiritual pride because spiritual pride is one of the things the devil loves because he can use it to completely undermine our witness for Christ. Thirdly, cultivate humility and an awareness of your own unworthiness but for Christ. This, of course, is the great antidote to spiritual pride. If you are aware of how much you have been forgiven, how much without Christ you are unable to do even one thing that is good, the more that we understand that, the more that will lead to a deep humility where our hearts are filled with wonder at the grace of God and we are not focused on ourselves, but we're focused on Christ and on others. Fourth, flee from embracing any sort of superior inner ring. That word flee is a strong one that implies being very proactive. We all like to be in the know. We all like to think that we are somehow superior to other people, that we're in the in group. And what we learn from Screwtape is that he loves that. Uh, that is deadly for the Christian to develop that sort of attitude. And fifthly, flee from the temptation to believe that only those who agree with you in every particular are the only real Christians. We have to learn to develop love for all people who call on the name of Jesus Christ, certainly love for our enemies as well, but particularly within the household of faith, Satan would love for us to bicker and argue and quarrel with other Christians so that we become so distracted by that that we miss out on the world that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. So from letter 25, the first habit to annoy the devil, center your bond of fellowship deeply in your common faith in Jesus Christ. And here Screwtape is talking about how the worst thing that can happen, one of the worst things from his point of view, is for Christians to be in real fellowship, real relationship with one another, where they are encouraging one another in their faith. And to substitute for that, what he would like to do, what Screwtape would like, is if the Christians have to get together to make sure they never talk about Jesus, they never talk about their faith, they never talk about what it looks like to live that faith out in the world, and they certainly don't worship God together or share encouragement or testimonies with one another that would encourage one another. So when we are with our brothers and sisters in the faith, it is a reminder that the habit to develop is to focus in on that bond that we share in Jesus Christ. Secondly, beware letting your faith get co-opted by any cause that you may embrace. And there are certainly a lot of good causes out there. We see right now in our culture a lot of causes uh, that deserve support. But the important thing is that for Christians, our cause is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Loving God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. And if our cause and our commitment to it gets in the way of our gospel witness, things are out of line. Screwtape is well aware that the enemy of the best is very often the good. If you can get someone obsessed with something that's good, that person will never move on to what is excellent, to what is most important. So it is a reminder to us as Christians that yes, we are to 
work for what is right, but always in the context of keeping the gospel and love for God and for others first and foremost. Thirdly, enjoy the rhythm and predictability of each season and its unique blessings. Screwtape talks about how God has created everything with a rhythm, that creation explodes with the beautiful rhythm of the seasons, spring and summer and fall and winter, each with its own beauties, each longed for, each uh, missed when it goes. And he talks about how that seasonal rhythm is something that is part and parcel of how God has made things. And that you want, he, Satan, screw tape, wants to sow discord about that. So you never appreciate the season that you're in. You're always complaining or, dare I say, peevish about not being in the season that you would prefer. And that is very true about seasons of life as well. As we all know from Ecclesiastes in that famous passage, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. But what Screwtape would love for us to do is to always be unhappy with the season that we're in. If we're students, to be unhappy that we're still in school and we can't embrace the adult world. If we're in the adult world, longing for that time when somebody else paid the bills. When we are older, missing that time that we didn't have health concerns. All of these kinds of things where we focus on what we don't like about the season we're in instead of the blessings that each season has. Fourthly, avoid the horror of the same old thing and the incessant quest for novelty. This is a theme that comes up in so much of Lewis's writing and related to what we saw last week in the historical point of view. But it's the idea that anything that's old, uh, whether it is knowledge or a book or just what we ate or what we did last week, those things should be rejected because they're in the past. And we need something new, something invigorating, something exciting, something on the cutting edge. And what Screwtape does is to show how that can make you get into a state of mind where you are never content, where you never experience joy, which is just what Screwtape wants. And so therefore, one of the things that we can do is to reject that incessant quest for novelty, to reject the horror of the same old thing, and to look for the blessings and the joy that can be found in tradition and in the wisdom of the past. Fifthly, be wary of adopting fashions, especially spiritual ones, that may blind you to the true dangers of your time. This is something that the church desperately needs to remember, because it is all too easy for us to get caught up in spiritual fads, where we're all focused on one aspect of spiritual life, and we're totally missing out on another. And Jesus had a lot to say about this with the Pharisees, where they were so focused on certain matters of the law that they neglected the other ones, the much more important ones, about justice and love and mercy. And Jesus says of them, they strained out a gnat, but swallowed a camel. My brothers and sisters, let that not be true of us. We need to remember the whole counsel of God and not get distracted by spiritual fads. Sixthly, resist discarding the wisdom of the past in favor of ideas whose only virtue is that they are new or progressive. We talked about Lewis's great inaugural lecture at Cambridge, De Descriptione Temporum, and the whole idea that Lewis was worried because of the way that technology works, that new technology is almost always really and truly better than old technology, that people would begin to use the assumptions about that to view everything else in life as well. And Lewis was right. So one of the things we can do to annoy the devil is to embrace the good wisdom of the past, wisdom that's rooted especially in the word of God, and to remember that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. 
and to realize that new ideas may have some virtues, but that there is great wisdom in the past, particularly in the Christian wisdom of the past. So from letter 26, the first habit, be proactive in positive virtue and don't define your faith in terms of what you don't do. So often it is easy for us to start feeling self-righteous by saying, I don't do that, I don't think that way, I don't say those kinds of things, and therefore I am better than other people. And what Screwtape wants is for us to adopt that kind of view. So, so of, of course, to annoy him, the best things we can do are to proactively live out the call of Jesus Christ. And of course, that chief call is to proactively love God and to proactively love and serve our neighbors. Secondly, beware, be wary of defining selfishness on your own terms, judging the selfishness of others, but turning a blind eye to your own. It is all too easy for all of us, including me, to do this, to think, well, of course I'm not selfish, but look at those other people. If they would be more like me, we would all be better off. Well, that is insidious, and it is the road to spiritual pride and a whole host of other things that are uh, things that would delight the devil. So we have to be on guard against selfishness, and one of the best ways to do that is to try to cultivate a servant heart, and again, that proactive love for others. That's old adage that joy comes from putting Jesus first, others second, and yourself last, has a lot of truth to it. Thirdly, practice clear and open and honest communication, speaking the truth and love. This is such a great reminder to not play games in the way that we communicate with people, to not be dishonest, but to be open, but to speak the truth and love. And again, to avoid those extremes of speaking the truth, but with no love and sometimes even with malice, or speaking only love, but leaving out all truth. Again, the fourth one related to that, beware accumulating grudges. When we are operating out of a grudge or out of bitterness and resentment, we do not honor Jesus. It reminds me of that quotation that is attributed to Nelson Mandela, that unforgiveness, operating out of unforgiveness and resentment, is like drinking poison yourself and hoping it kills your enemy. These kinds of grudges really hurt us and those around us. They prevent us from living the fruitful life that God calls us to, and they quench the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And fifth, practice serving in humble, loving charity without expectation of notice or reward. We need to examine our hearts and think about why are we doing what we're doing? Are we doing it because we want people to notice us and think, oh, he is so great. Isn't it wonderful that he did that? We need to be reminded that Jesus tells us that we are to not let our left hand know what our right hand is doing and that our service should be done in secret, that God might be glorified, that people might look if they see what we're doing, but not praise us, but give praise to our Father who is in heaven. And then from letter 27 last week, first, practice open and honest prayer that addresses the real issues in your life. We do not need to develop a prayer life that tries to make us sound like Thomas Cranmer and the Book of Common Prayer. That is not what it is about. Our prayer life needs to be more like that of the tax collector in Jesus' parable who fell on his feet and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our prayer life needs to be the open and honest conversation before God, our loving Father. Secondly, we need to contract the terrible habit of obedience. Obedience is something that, 
in many other ages of the Christian faith was highly prized, but as we have elevated feelings and experience more and more each decade out of the past hundred years, obedience is looked on sometimes now as a negative thing. To obey, to follow a rule for heaven's sake, why would you want to do that? That is just for people who are uh, brute mules, that we shouldn't do that. But of course, scripture tells us that obedience is beautiful. To obey is better than sacrifice. And so in our prayer life and in all of our life, we need to seek to be obedient and we need to be under the word of God. Thirdly, we need to cultivate an eternal perspective and realize that God sees everything in his unbounded now. All too often, because we are creatures who live in time, who are run by our alarms and our watches and our Google calendar and all of that, we forget that God is outside of time. He is not on our timetable. He's not bound by our timetable. And we need to let go of that and look at things through an eternal perspective. One of my mentors when I was in college was fond of saying that a great way when you are stressed and you're thinking you need to develop an eternal perspective is to think about the lens of what will this matter in a hundred years anyway. And if it doesn't matter at all, then you need to just let it go. But if it does matter, then you might need to focus on that. Fourth, avoid embracing the fallacies of the historical point of view and deconstructionism. And this again is an area where Lewis was prophetic. And he said that the problem is that when we look at writers of the past, that we no longer look at them and look at what they wrote and think about whether there's truth there that should be applied to our lives, especially truth that might be rooted and consonant with a Christian worldview in the scriptures that we need to appropriate today. Instead, we look at all of the lenses that um, might affect whether what they said was valid, about whether they had some systemic sin in their life or through our point of view today, they would be regarded as less than virtuous. And if there's anything about them we don't like, then we can throw out wholesale everything that they said. And Lewis says this is the devil's work because it will cause us to throw out the accumulated wisdom of the human race, and particularly the accumulated wisdom of Christendom, and that we do that at our peril. And then lastly, to seek proactively to learn from the wisdom of the past, especially Christian wisdom. We've talked about before in this class how for most of Christian history, children were brought up reading the lives of the saints, and they were told about the scriptures and the stories of the apostles and the early church. And these lives of saints were held up not to worship the saints, but to give us encouragement of the example of the great cloud of witnesses who has gone on before us in the church triumphant. And it is a reminder that we need to learn from those people. And we are so fortunate that we have so many records and writings from people that were great saints of God, many of whom gave their very lives because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And we would do well to spend more time reading and contemplating and praying over their lives and witness. So that brings us to letter 28. Letter 28 is another marvelous letter. So please get your books, get your highlighters, be ready as we jump in to this delightful letter. My dear Wormwood, when I told you not to fill your letters with rubbish about the war, I meant, of course, that I did not want to have your rather infantile rhapsodies about the death of men and the destruction of cities. Insofar as the war really concerns the spiritual state of the patient, I naturally want full reports. And on this aspect, you seem singularly obtuse. Thus, 
You tell me with glee that there is reason to expect heavy air raids on the town where the creature lives. This is a crying example of something I have complained about already. Your readiness to forget the main point in your immediate enjoyment of human suffering. Do you not know that bombs kill men? Or do you not realize that the patient's death at this moment is precisely what we want to avoid? He has escaped the worldly friends with whom you tried to entangle him. He has fallen in love with a very Christian woman and is temporarily immune from your attacks on his chastity and the various methods of corrupting his spiritual life, which we've been trying so far, are unsuccessful. At the present moment, as the full impact of the war draws nearer and his worldly hopes take a proportionately lower place in his mind, full of his defense work, full of the girl, forced to attend to his neighbors more than he has ever done before, and liking it more than he expected, taken out of himself, as the humans say, and daily increasing in conscience dependence on the enemy? He will almost certainly be lost to us if he is killed tonight. This is so obvious I am ashamed to write it. I sometimes wonder if you young fiends are not kept out on temptation duty too long, too long at a time if you are not in some danger of becoming infected by the sentiments and values of the human beings among whom you work. They, of course, do tend to regard death as the prime evil and survival as the greatest good. But that is because we have taught them to do so. Do not let us be infected by our own propaganda. I know it seems strange that your chief aim at the moment should be the very same thing for which the patient's lover and his mother are praying, namely his bodily safety. But so it is. You should be guarding him like the apple of your eye. If he dies now, you lose him. If he survives the war, there is always hope. The enemy has guarded him from you through the first great wave of temptation. But if he can only be kept alive, you have time itself for your ally. The long, dull, monotonous years of middle-aged prosperity or middle-aged adversity are excellent campaigning weather. You see, it is so hard for these creatures to persevere. The routine of adversity, the gradual decay of youthful loves and youthful hopes, the quiet despair, hardly felt as pain, of ever overcoming the chronic temptations with which we have again and again defeated them, the drabness with which, which we create in their lives, and the inarticulate resentment with which we teach them to respond to it. All this provides admirable opportunities of wearing out a soul by attrition. If, on the other hand, the middle years prove prosperous, our position is even stronger. Prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it, which really means that it is finding its place. In him. His increasing reputation, his widening circle of acquaintances, his sense of importance, the growing pressure of absorbing and agreeable work build up in him a sense of being really at home in earth, which is just what we want. You will notice that the young are generally less unwilling to die than the middle-aged and the old. 
The truth is that the enemy, having oddly destined these mere animals to life in his own eternal world, has guarded them pretty effectively from the danger of feeling at home anywhere else. This is why we must often wish long life to our patients. Seventy years is not a day too much for the difficult task of unraveling their souls from heaven and building up a firm attachment to earth. While they are young, we find them always shooting off at a tangent, even if we contrive to keep them ignorant of explicit religion, the incalculable winds of fantasy and music and poetry, the mere face of a girl, the song of a bird, or the sight of a horizon, are always blowing our whole structure away. They will not apply themselves steadily to worldly advancement prudent connections, and the policy of safety first. So inveterate is their appetite for heaven that our best method at this stage of attaching them to earth is to make them believe that earth can be turned into heaven at some future date by politics or by eugenics or by science or by psychology, or whatnot. Real worldliness is a work of time, assisted, of course, by pride, for we teach them to describe the creeping death as good sense, or maturity, or experience. Experience, in the peculiar sense we teach them to give it, is, by the by, a most useful word. A great human philosopher nearly let our secret out when he said that where virtue is concerned, experience is the mother of illusion. But thanks to a change in fashion, and also, of course, to the historical point of view, we have largely rendered his book innocuous. How valuable time is to us may be gauged by the fact that the enemy allows us so little of it. The majority of the human race dies in infancy. Of the survivors, a good many die in youth. It is obvious to him that to him human birth is important chiefly as the qualification for human death, and death solely as the gate to that other kind of life. We are allowed to work only on a selected minority of the race, for what humans call a normal life is the exception. Apparently, he wants some, but only a very few, of the human animal, animals with which he is peopling heaven to have had the experience of resisting us through an earthly life of 60 or 70 years. Well, there is our opportunity. The smaller it is, the better we must use it. Whatever you do, keep your patient as safe as you possibly can. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. Well, there's a lot in this letter, and there's a lot that we could go on and on and on about, but I will try to restrain myself to the habits here this evening. So the first habit to annoy the devil is to daily increase in conscious dependence upon God rather than on worldly hopes. The whole theme of this letter is about how if Christians get so attached to the world and reforming the world and trying to make the world into heaven, we have played right into Screwtape's hands because when we do that, we forget our priorities. We stop seeking to love God first and foremost, and we instead end up being focused on the things of this earth. So the result of that is that we are stuck in a situation where we are focused on the wrong thing. As we think about this first habit, one of the first parts of scripture that comes to mind is right out of the Lord's Prayer itself. Remember that Jesus instructs us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. 
It is a reminder of that principle that's all through Scripture about cultivating daily dependence on God. And it is a reminder, even in that petition from the Lord's Prayer, all the way back to the Old Testament at the time when the Israelites were being fed by the manna. And God would feed them each day with the manna, but he ordered them not to try to store it up for the future, and that if they tried to take more than they needed for a day, then it would rot. It is a reminder that cultivating daily dependence on God is really, really important. And when we do that, it helps remind us that our real home is not this world. And then there's this verse from 1 Timothy 6, where Paul is addressing the rich, but all of us qualify as rich by the standards that Paul would have used. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of worldly riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And then that beautiful verse from Matthew 24, when Jesus says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. It is a reminder that this earth, this world is fleeting, that we are not to base our lives on a foundation of sand in the things of this world, but we need to be consciously depending on God and seeking his kingdom each day. The second habit is to fight against drabness in and resentment at your situation in life. It is a reminder that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all of those things. And part of what happens all too easily for some of us in the Christian life is that as the quality of our obedience and our dependence on God is reduced, we become infected with bitterness and resentment and our lives seem boring and we don't see the activity of the Holy Spirit. And we think, why am I going through the motions? I'm like the little hamster on the wheel. But the scriptures tell us that that is not the way that Christians are to live. Remember, Jesus said, The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. So Christians should be people who are full of joy and the fruit of the Spirit. And so we need to fight against those times when drabness and resentment are trying to come after us. Because Screwtape tells us that a drab, resentful Christian is going to be of great joy to screw tape and our father below. That whole idea is that Christians who are not living with the fruit of the Spirit become disenchanted and they start finding the allure of the world more interesting. So a beautiful reminder from Psalm 16, you will show me the path that leads to life Your presence fills me with joy and brings me pleasure forever. My friends, if we are regularly in the presence of the Lord, we cannot help but know joy. And this great word from Proverbs 13, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And we know from elsewhere that the tree of life Uh, referenced way back in Genesis, but also referenced in uh, Revelation and also uh, in Psalm 1, becoming that tree planted by the streams of waters. So much of that has to do with obedience to the word of God, being that kind of tree that grows straight and true and strong with its roots in the word of the Lord. And then from Acts 8. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And these are Peter's words to Simon. And you see here 
that he is telling Simon that he is trapped in this resentment and bitterness and iniquity, and that he needs to be freed from it. He needs to repent of it and return to the Lord so that the intent of his heart may be forgiven and his heart may be set right to love and serve the Lord. The third habit related to these first two, be on guard against your heart being too knitted to this world instead of to your true homeland. There's much that is beautiful in this world because God has made it, but there's much that is not beautiful in this world. And we need constantly to be reminded that we were not made for this world. We are made for another world. We're made for the kingdom of heaven. That is the kingdom where our true citizenship lies. And if we become too attached to this world and begin to think that this world is all that there is, we will slowly creep away from the priority of the kingdom of God by becoming too involved in the things of this world. Listen to these scriptures. This first one should be familiar because we say it so often in church. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be be also. And I want us to think just a little bit about that word treasure. Treasure is that uh, great thing when you're children that you want to discover and you have those children's books with treasure maps where X marks the spot. And the idea is that if you find that treasure, then you will have the greatest joy that could ever happen. And what Jesus says is that that is very true and that where our treasure is, what we believe is most important that we orient our lives around, our hearts will be there as well. So we are not to lay up treasure on earth. And that doesn't just mean money. It means causes. It means things that preoccupy us. If we are preoccupied solely by things of this earth, we are off course. Secondly, this is a great verse from Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 and 12 are great chapters to read in their entirety on this theme. So this is just a little snippet. And it's talking about some of the heroes of faith in the scriptures. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had come out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. My friends, this is a beautiful reminder that God made us for his kingdom. And that promise that we see in Jesus and in all of Paul's letters is gloriously fulfilled in St. John's vision and the revelation of the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth, adorned like a bride for her husband coming down from heaven. That is what we are made for. We are made for that city, for that country, and we need to be living in such a way that we are preparing our hearts for that. Fourthly, there's that great line in the letter where Screwtape says that all the work that Screwtape and Wormwood are doing can be swept away by what he calls the incalculable, which uh, is his way of saying something really unbelievably awful. And for him, that can be music and poetry and literature. That those things of beauty, truth, and goodness that we've discussed earlier can come right into the patient's life and blow away all of the work that Satan has done because it turns the perspective of the patient back toward the beauty of the Lord and of his kingdom. So listen to these words 
from Colossians 3. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish each other with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Beautiful music, especially beautiful music that focuses on God and his worthiness, will tune your heart to sing his praise. And I commend to you that link that will be in the email um, from the uh, anthem that we heard at the beginning today. And it is beautiful. And it is the word of God set to music. And it will bless you if you listen to it. And then that great verse from Philippians that many of you will remember. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. When our minds are set on these things, on the beauty, truth, goodness, of God's kingdom, it sets our hearts and our minds in a posture that is open to the work of the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, Satan encounters that impenetrable cloud and can't get at us. Fifthly, beware of the illusion that politics or policies or any human progress can make heaven on earth. Beware of the illusion that politics or policies or any human progress can make heaven on earth. This does not mean, of course, that we are not to fight for justice and freedom and all of those kinds of things, but it means we are to do it as Christians in the context of the gospel of Jesus Christ in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are not to let any cause become more important than our witness as Christians. Because we know from the word of God that there is nothing that will change the human heart except an encounter with Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Legislating morality can never be the be-all and end-all. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't work for what is right and true and good, but we must work first for proclaiming the word of God. Because as Screwtape says, they want us to believe that we can build heaven on earth, that if we just get the right people in office, if we just change the legislation or the policies or the educational system, then suddenly everything will be okay. We won't have to worry anymore about the sinfulness of human beings. But the fact of the matter is Jesus got it exactly right. His whole ministry was focused on encountering people and changing their hearts by leading them to faith in God and understanding that they belong to a different kingdom. And when their hearts were changed, suddenly they practiced love and servanthood and treating all, regardless of race or creed or gender or whatever it might be, as brothers and sisters. So this is a good reminder to us, particularly in these days, to keep the main thing the main thing. Listen to these words from Psalm 146. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. And then this great passage from 1 Corinthians, which I would commend to you. 1 Corinthians 1, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased to the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks seek for wisdom. 
but we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. To those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. It is he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and it spreads them like a dwelling tent, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as an emptiness. My friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the thing that will change the world. And when we preach it and proclaim it in the power of the Spirit and surrounded by the love of the saints, it is something that will change the world and indeed is the only thing that has changed the world. Sixth, cultivate an understanding of safety that has more to do with being in the will of God than with your own personal comfort. This is a hard word for us in our culture because we prize safety and we prize our comfort. But there is that old saying that the job of the preacher is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And the reason for that is that when we are comfortable, we all too easily become wedded to this world. We are unwilling to take risks and to step out in faith for the gospel because we are afraid of what may happen. But when we remember that our ultimate home is in heaven and that the only one we really need to fear is Satan, um, when we rely on Jesus and we are in the center of his will, we are in the safest place that there is. It may not be safe for our physical life, but for our spiritual life and our ultimate destiny, it is the very best place to be. That is why Screwtape says you want the patient to be all worried about his safety all the time, because if he's consumed with worrying about that, he won't be worried about being obedient to the word of God. Listen to this from Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. And then St. Paul's great words in 2 Timothy 4. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. You see, Paul sees his citizenship in heaven. This earthly life, he is all about doing what the Lord calls him to in that life, but as soon as the Lord's call is up on that, he is ready to move into the kingdom that is, is his true home. We need to do what that verse in Proverbs says, to trust in the Lord and not in our own wisdom. We of all ages of humanity are perhaps most prone to lean on our own understanding. We think that we have developed great knowledge and great wisdom because of our technological might and the knowledge in our, at our fingertips through the internet, all of those things. But my friends, all of this really is just data. It's just information. And without the Holy Spirit's quickening power, all of this can never qualify as wisdom. So we need to understand that our safety comes from being united with Jesus Christ, that there is no other place that the Christian can experience the fullness of joy than the presence of the Lord himself. So I commend to you this letter and these habits to reflect on. The letter is worth rereading several times because it is rich 
uh, with really good content to help us understand how flawed the thinking of this age is. And it's remarkable how what Screwtape is saying is so very similar to what the conventional wisdom of our day is. And it makes us realize how important it is as Christians that we resist that. And of course, as we close each time, one of the best ways to resist is that terrible habit of obedience. So let's say together that quotation from the eighth letter. Our cause is never more in danger, Wormwood, than a human no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. Let's close with a word of prayer. O oh Lord, we thank you for the wisdom of your word and for Jesus' promise that he comes to bring life and to bring that abundantly. Lord, we pray that you would remind us that Satan comes to steal and kill and destroy and that the wisdom of this world, the conventional wisdom that is based just in human wisdom, will lead us astray. Lord, we pray that you would so knit our hearts to you and the things of your kingdom that we would see this world as passing away. Lord, that we would love those who are made in your image, uh, that we would love our neighbor as ourselves, that we would love you with our whole heart, but that we would not mistake this earthly tent for our ultimate destiny, that you would remind us that our true home is with you in heaven and that your kingdom is not the kingdom of this world. That is that great work the Messiah says, quoting from Isaiah, the kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Lord, at the last day is when this kingdom of this world becomes your kingdom. Lord, let us not get confused about when that happens. Lord, we pray that you would help us to apply our hearts to your wisdom and that you would produce in us the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control, that there is no law against these things, and that as we live in the power of your Spirit, people would be drawn to you. For we pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this evening. I pray that God will bless you as you consider these things, as you annoy the devil, and as we go further up and further in.